Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings of the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in by Blue Ontario Shore and we turn now to the catalog section of passages 6, 7, and 8. The uh, life-giving poet. In fact, we're going to use language here that's quite radical, seminal muscle. Um, we're going to hear about embryos and gestation. That is to say, Whitman, the bard, the poet, now becomes the creator of America. And we, of course, have seen this referenced already, and we're going to play more games with it. The assumptions for us is that you've already been working with us at LearnStrong.net down the left-hand side, Talks with Waldock Playlist. And that you've been with us from the very beginning, the early inscriptions, poems, up through and including everything that precedes these sets of lines, including a set of introductory comments for Blue Ontario, and I'm hopeful that you've already studied that. And we've already worked out with passages 1 through 5 as we turn now to 6, 7, and 8. Now this is, of course, as we said, one of the great catalog sections, passage 6 especially. So we'll pay attention to it, and we'll work rather hastily to get through it, but we want to not miss the power of what's uh, being said. If earlier in passage 5 it was nation of nations, now it's land of lands. Notice, land of lands and bards, notice it's plural, to corroborate. Uh, Song of the Rolling Earth 3 will play this game of corroborate. In other words, there are... There's more bards to come. In other words, Whitman imagines himself giving birth to more poets to come. And of course, the great Allen Ginsberg pointed out that it was lines like this that turned him on to the very idea that he could become the nation's poet. Of them, standing among them, one lifts to the light a westward face. Now, this idea of being westbred, in other words, we're constantly expanding. And, of course, the idea of to the light is powerful symbolism. To him, the hereditary continuance bequeathed both brothers and fathers. In other words, this is what we've been given. His first parts, substances, earth, water, animals, trees. Notice those four. Of course, animals makes us think of Song of Myself, Passage 32. Built of the common stock, democracy, having room for far and near, used to dispense with other nations, incarnating this land. And this is the only time incarnating gets used in Leaves of Grass, but we're going we're gonna to play into this idea right away. Attracting it body and soul to himself, hanging on its neck with incomparable love. You'll remember in Spontaneous Me that it was arm of my friend hangs around the neck, the, the word picture here is. Plunging his seminal muscle into its merits and demerits. Now, this kind of sexual language, we're going to come back to it a little bit with embryo, and then a little bit later with gestation. Um, and it, this idea takes us back to a woman waits for me with the word plunging. You'll remember that use of it. Norton's will tell us that this word seminal in 1856 and in 60 and 67 editions, this adjective was erroneously Semitic, spelled S-E-M-I-T-I-C. Um, um, and, and, and as was also the case in the preface of 1855, and then, and then the, uh, and then the adjustment was made. Notice we're making, we're back to making, right? Making its cities, beginnings, events, diversities, wars. There's five of those vocal in him. Making its rivers, lakes, bays, embouchure in him. By the way, the embouchure here just means um, the mouth of the river turned in, uh, into a verb, obviously. And then again, he starts to, starts to list uh, and name things. Mississippi, with yearly freshets and changing shoots. Columbia, Niagara, Hudson, spending themselves lovingly in him. Again, from plunging to spending. If the Atlantic Coast stretch uh, or the Pacific Coast stretch, he stretching with them north or south. In other words, as America stretches, as America grows, the great poet Bard will do the same. Spanning between them east and west and touching whatever is between them. Growths growing, again, back to the evolutionary model. Yeah, I think he learned some of this from his study of Hegel. From him to offset the growths of, now we're going to get ten trees. Pine, cedar, hemlock, live oak. We've heard of that in Louisiana. Locust, chestnut, hickory, cottonwood, orange, magnolia. Then he uses the word tangles, which is cool because it takes us back to lilacs entwined. Tangles as tangled in him as any canebrake or swamp. Back to the lilacs and swamp, right? He likening sides and peaks of mountains. Forests coated with northern transparent ice. Off him, pasturage is sweet and natural as savanna, upland, and prairie. Notice the three. Through him, 
flights, whirls, screams, there's three, answering those of the fishhawk, we're going to get birds now, four of them, fishhawk, mockingbird, night heron, and eagle, his spirit surrounding his country spirit. I want you to pay attention to the use of the word surrounding here. Unclosed to good and evil, surrounding the essences of real things. Do you remember in Song of the Open Road, um, in, in passage 14, it's provided in the essence of things? We're back to this idea of essence of real things. Old times and present times, surrounding just found shores, islands, tribes of red aborigines. We've commented already in our earlier study that Whitman had a somewhat racist view of Native Americans, and here he'll play that game with the, with the word red. Um, Weather-beaten vessels, landing, settlements, embryos, stature, and muscle. We're back to the idea of one more time. The muscle, here it's embryo, stature, and muscle. The haughty defiance of the year one. In other words, the first year of American independence from 1776 on. War, peace, the formation of the Constitution. What's he saying? The greatest poets of America will always take into consideration the very beginning of the country and then move forward. Think about Amanda Gorman's great poem, The Hill We Climb, and the way that she had that brilliant, brilliant poem on that magnificent day of our president. Um, and she's reading that poem. Notice that she went all the way back. We've given full lectures on it at LearnStrong.net about this poem. But notice that she does the very thing that Whitman is doing. She was in some ways channeling the very thing Whitman, in fact, predicted, that our young bards would be able to go all the way back to the very beginning. The separate states, the simple, elastic scheme, the immigrants, the union, always swarming. Um, in the 1855 preface, by the way, this word is not swarming, but surrounded. With blatherers. And always sure, in the, in the preface of 1855, it wasn't sure, it was calm and impregnable. In other words, back to it. Nothing can harm us from the outside because we've already tried to destroy ourselves from the inside and it didn't work. It didn't succeed. We didn't fail. Hurrah, in other words. The unsurveyed interior, that is to say, now he's thinking about the West, log houses, clearings, wild animals, hunters, trappers, surrounding the multiform agriculture, mines, temperature, the distinction of the new states. So notice we go from the seminal muscle to the to the embryo stature and muscle to now gestation of the new states. Congress convening every 12th month. The members duly coming up from the utmost the uttermost parts. Surrounding again the use of the word surrounding the noble character of mechanics and farmers. It takes us to I hear America singing, especially the young men. Responding their manners, speech, dress, friendships, uh, friendships, the gait they have of persons who have never, who who never know how it felt to stand in the presence of superiors. A great line, of course, from the preface. In other words, this is what makes America amazing: is that all of us stand in each other's company as equals. It's quite quite a remarkable statement of democracy. The freshness and candor of their physiognomy. The copiousness and decision of their phrenology. In 1846, Whitman would read in the American Review his first essay about phrenology, and then he would become a huge follower of it. And obviously, it's bogus science, but uh, we just want to point out, he was trying to stay tuned into the new science of his day. The picturesque looseness of their carriage, the way that they would they, the way that they walk, the picture, of course, in the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass showed Whitman as being very kind of loose, this word loose, the, the, their, his carriage. Their fierceness when wrong, we're going to go back to this fierceness in passage 7. The fluency of their speech, their delight in music, he always comes back to that. Their curiosity, I think that's one of the keys of always for Whitman. Are you curious? If you have read all of the lines of Leaves of Grass and studied them with us, you're curious, and Whitman would applaud you for that. Notice good temper, open-handedness, the whole composite make, the prevailing ardor and enterprise, the large amativeness. Now this is that phrenology term that means actually sexual love. The perfect equality of the male with the female. The fluid movement, we're back from to the seminal thing again, of the population. The superior marine, free commerce, fisheries, whaling, gold digging, Wharfham cities, we'll think of course of Brooklyn Ferry, railroad and steamboat lines, intersecting all points. Factories, mercantile life, labor-saving machinery, we're back to, of course, the celebration of technology. The Northeast, Northwest, Southwest, Manhattan firemen, the Yankee swap, Southern plantation life. And then, to end this passage, the word slavery. And Turno Libertad 
and unnamed lands are the only three other uses of this word slavery. Notice the dash. And then his most powerful statement against the idea and the institution of slavery. The murderous, treacherous conspiracy to raise it upon the ruins of all the rest. On and on to the grapple with it. And then the word after the dash, assassin, with an exclamation point, then your life or ours be the stake and respite no more. Wow. So in other words, if ever we had question about Whitman as abolitionist and his view of slavery, by the end of the war, he sees it. The institution of slavery is what leads to the secession of the southern states and therefore the near dissolution of the great America country that he loves. And here, notice, it is murderous, it is treacherous, it is a conspiracy. And notice again the word grapple that comes to mind. We go back to our Beowulf study and you'll remember that that's the word in Old English that is actually used to talk about what Beowulf wants to do with Grendel. Grappling, right? Wrestling and the like. And of course, holding and grappling, we commented already, at least the grass is constant there. Now when we meet passage uh, 7, um, uh, Norton's uh, will tell us that section 7, beginning with the line, uh, was added in, in 1867, um, it being pasted by the poet in his blue copy in the 1860 editions. I think this is one of those kind of parenthetical phrases, but it's really an important one. Take a look at it. Lo, high toward heaven this day, libertad, from the con uh, uh, conqueror's Congress's field returned. I mark the new aurora around your head. There was a child went forth. We'll see this word again uh, with Earl. No more of soft astral, but dazzling and fierce. You'll remember dazzling from Song of Myself, passage 46. Have it yourself to the dazzle of the light. Fierce takes us back, of course, to passage 6 and the fierceness when wronged. Fierce with wars, flames, and lampant lightings playing and your port immovable where you stand with still the inex inextinguishable glance and the clenched and lifted fist and your foot on the neck of the menacing one. This is all tied to that comment at the end of a passage uh, uh, 6 regarding slavery. The scorner utterly crushed beneath you, the menacing arrogant one that strode and advanced with his senseless scorn, Bearing the murderous knife, there was a lot made, of course, of Cain killing Abel and the idea that brother against brother and all of that. You are your brother's keeper and all of that. The wide swelling one, the braggart that would yesterday do so much. White swelling takes us, of course, back to obese earlier in the poem. Today, a carrion, dead and damned. We're going to get to damned uh, um, uh, again in this poem. The despised of all the earth, an awful rank to the dunghill maggots spurred. This is, without question, the strongest language in all of Lisa Grass thus far against those of the South and the Confederacy who would gamble on the Union over an institution of slavery. It's compelling. To finish, in passage 8 now, the poet is builder. And I find this remarkable language as well. Notice the repetition of the O sounds. First it's two with others, then it's four more times with O. Others take finish, but the Republic, notice capitalized, is ever constructive and ever keeps vista. We're back to Song of Myself, passage 46, and that standing on the knoll and looking out in the vista and the view. Of course, no question, Whitman was keenly aware of what we will call the declension of state argument of Plato's Republic. Notice the use of the word Republic. Others adorn the past, and I think here he's referencing Plato. But you, O oh days of the present, I adorn you, that is to say, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Oh, days of the future, I believe in you. Um, you'll remember in Song of Myself, Passage 5, I believe in you, O oh, my soul. Here it is. I isolate myself for your sake. Oh, America, because you build for mankind, I build for you. Notice the symbiotic, again, we're back to that seminal muscle uh, idea. The symbiosis, the symbiotic nature. The poet, the bard, helps to convince the country it's time to build and rebuild. And in the process, then the poet is also, also building. Oh, well below stone cutters, I lead them who plan with decision and science. Uh, and our, uh, and our Nortons will tell us that this line and about 20 lines following in sections 9 and 10 originated in the 1855 preface. Um, and that's why maybe they'll sound as, as, as echoes for you. By the way, remember that in Idolans, he uses this word science. 
lead the present with friendly hand toward the future. I told you about this use of the hand and hand holding that he learned from Milton in Paradise Lost. And of course, toward the future is only going to be used one time in all these of grass. And it's right here. Future, by the way, used four times in this poem. Then we'll get in a parenthetic, bravas, as in good job, to all impulses sending sane children to the next age, exclamation point. That is to say, we got to grow beyond the war. Notice the use of the word sane as opposed to insane. Notice the use of the word children, and obviously mother has been mentioned earlier in the poem. But, again, this is in parenthetic. I think this is in direct relationship back to passage 7, which is again in relationship to the last lines of 6. But, damn that which spins itself with no thought of the stain, pains, dismay, feebleness it is bequeathing. In other words, what is it that he wants to say to those who started this insane fiasco, this civil war? Well, he, first of all, he says, we're damned if we go back. Again, damned was, was used before. By the way, only time damned gets used in all of these of grass here, it's right here. But damned that which spins itself, or kind of back to the sexual language of spending or, 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 or somehow um, um, providing useless uh, seminal muscle, uh, seminal fluid, right, spins itself. There's almost, there's almost a, a, a sexual rendering of this idea of spending itself with no thought of the stain. And again, the word stain can be understood in so many different ways. Stain takes us back to trickle drops. You'll remember that poem that we studied. Notice the, the, the internal um, uh, sounding too with stains, pains, dismay, Feebleness, uh, the Civil War weakened us, that it is bequeathing. Obviously, we got that play of words of sending versus spending. And no question, he's speaking to the Confederacy and to those supporters of the South and the institution of slavery as he finishes up with this passage. What are we going to say here at 2A? Well, I think the argument is that the true poet gives life, literally shares life. And we should never allow, the again, the stain to happen. We've got to learn from the mistakes of the past. This is why I've said already that some people today are suggesting it's time for another civil war. And I think what Whitman would say is, no, 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 it's time to pick up and read Leaves of Grass. And when we read it, we'll be reminded of why we've got to be together. We cannot be, we cannot allow for the stain to happen. At 2B, I love the power of the cataloging. I love the controversial language. I think that Whitman is at his best when he steps out into the sunlight and he says, I'm going to tell you what I really think, and I think it's powerful. At uh, 3A, well, I like to just think about who America's greatest poet builders are. I'll just mention the great Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech. We've given full lectures on it. I mentioned the, 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 the great young poet Amanda Gorman as well. That idea that we're always building, we're building off of the past. We are transcending it, though, no question about it. And finally, at 3B, who is your favorite builder, we might ask? For example, Maybe some of you see Steve Spielberg, the great filmmaker, as a great builder, or the great musician Bob Dylan as a great builder. I'm hopeful that you will see Whitman as, as well, the great builder, as we move on now to Section 9 and beyond. Thank you.